James Bach finds it useful to talk about test techniques as if they were recipes. Just as a recipe describes different ingredients and how to combine them, a technique describes several aspects of a type of test. Box list considers more issues than any particular technique will address. For example, domain testing teaches us how to analyze a program. It gives a model that guides design of individual tests. It also suggests where to look to see whether the program passed the test. But domain testing doesn't specify what equipment to test on, or how to set up the lab, or who should run the tests, or whether or how to automate the tests. It suggests data to collect, but not how to capture or store that data, or whether we could use a tool to interpret the results. Other techniques might focus more on these aspects of testing and less on the ones that domain testing focuses on. We'll come back to this list later in the course on test design. For now, as you learn more about test techniques, you might get to a point where you feel as though you're drowning in unrelated details. When you get there, think about these lists as stepping stones for a river of confusion. This list isn't perfect. It's a little slippery, but if you need the help, it's what we've got. So far today, we've hit six major concepts. We test in order to find quality-related information for our stakeholders. We focus our testing to make sure that we achieve our information objectives. On a given project, our mission is to achieve those objectives, to get the specific types of information that our stakeholders need. To achieve our mission, we develop a strategy. For our purposes today, the main component of the testing strategy is the guidance it gives us on what test techniques we should use, when, and how much we should rely on each. For the rest of today, we'll consider how testing efforts are organized in different companies. There's no one way to organize a testing effort. But let me start with an example that's fairly typical. Imagine a company called Softco that creates tax preparation software that it sells to other people. The customers buy the software and they also buy an update service. Probably they can cancel at any time. Softco writes and tests its own code. Programmers, managers, testers, tech support staff, and executives all work in the same building. Testers can meet all of them. Not only in formal ways, the company has social support relationships. They have parties, they have celebrations, informal gatherings, specifically because they want everybody to meet each other. Testers get to talk not just to other testers, not just to project managers, but to anybody. People take each other out for dinner. They go to pubs together or to cafes. When there's a problem that is hard to solve through the normal channels, people can talk to each other through the informal network. Informal communication networks are a common feature of American companies, especially companies that produce intellectual property like software. Now across companies, test groups differ enormously. Some companies call their staff testers, business analysts, quality engineers, software development engineers and test. Name doesn't matter. What does matter is how diverse the group is. Some companies try to hire people with similar backgrounds, similar education, skills, attitudes, and with that, they get similar weaknesses and similar blind spots. I don't think this works very well. If I was hiring for Softco's test group, I'd look for a very diverse set of skills. Softco makes tax preparation software, so they do a lot of database access, a lot of calculation. I'd like testers who understand how to break databases and how to confuse programs that work with numbers. I'd also go to law schools, recruit graduates who specialize in tax law. These would be my group's primary subject matter experts. If I was writing factory automation software, I'd find somebody who understands factories. As a test manager, I develop an understanding of the types of information that my group will often be asked to provide, and I recruit people who are really good with each of those types of information. The result is a group in which every person is special. Every person can cross-train every other person. Every person offers value, and every person has their own opportunity to gain the respect of many different stakeholders. There are no unskilled laborers in test groups that I form. Test groups do many tasks. The ones I describe here are pretty common among software publishers. Testers become experts in the product. That includes its market, its potential users, its potential uses, the ways it can fail and their possible consequences. The testers analyze specs, they hunt for bugs, they develop tools. Tools are code, maybe, specially designed data sets, procedures, anything that will help them be more efficient in the future. When testers find bugs, including design bugs, they research them well enough to write reports that make clear what the problem is and why it's important. This slide describes these tasks in something of a timeline. There are variations across companies, but as a rule developed over the past 27 years, when I visit a software company or a company that makes hardware products that have customer visible embedded software, like cell phones, I've come to expect these activities to be seen as normal things for testers to do. Note how many of these tasks are not strictly about hunting for bugs, writing bug reports, or designing or automating tests. 
The diversity of tasks in typical test groups becomes even more apparent when you consider the activities in this list. I'm never surprised to see a test group that does some of these tasks. Most test groups do some of these tasks, but different groups differ a lot as to which of these tasks they do. It's rare for a company's testers to do all of these things. For example, a company that treats its testers as part of a programming team is less likely to build a close collaboration between the testers in sales or the testers in marketing or tech support. Let me distinguish between the mission for a specific testing project and the mission of the group as a whole. For the project, your mission is dictated by the needs of your stakeholders. But for the group, the mission reflects the group's self-image, its reason for existing. If we think in terms of the services test groups provide, some see themselves purely as bug hunters. Many others see themselves as quality advocates or even quality enforcers. Others see themselves as fully integrated into a development group. They provide several different types of services that are intended to make development more effective and more efficient, not just testing at all. The testers' world changes in information technology organizations. Software publishers sell products that their development groups create. In contrast, companies don't sell what their information technology groups create. The IT organization is part of the company's infrastructure, not part of its product or service development. Many American companies treat their development, production, and sales organizations much more generously and with much more respect than their infrastructure. They distinguish between profit centers and cost centers. They work aggressively to squeeze the costs out of their cost centers. Many of these companies see IT as a cost center. I have seen effective test groups in IT organizations that have skilled, bright, career-satisfied testers. But I've also seen fundamental incompetence in many IT test groups. I've seen it tolerated for far longer than I would expect at a publisher. And worse, I've met far too many consultants and conference speakers who cater to incompetence in IT testing by spreading tolerance for whining, excuse-making, and obstructionist attitudes. Look, if it's not absolutely clear what your value is to your company, how your services contribute to the effectiveness and success of IT, and how IT contributes to the success of the company, and especially if the tasks you do are routine, essentially mindless tasks, then your salary is probably going nowhere, and your days in this job are probably numbered. Your skills are going nowhere, too. You need to do some career planning. Now, another type of test group is fully independent. When we talk about outsourcing, we're talking about retaining a separate test organization to do the testing usually because the outsourced services are perceived as cheaper. Testing by an external lab is fundamentally different from testing in-house. They might have better tools. They might have better skills. They might not, too. But what they lack is expertise in their client's business, and they lack budget to develop that expertise. The external test group is rarely an expert in its client company's products. Think of Softco, the tax company. The external lab is probably not an expert in tax software. They also don't have any links to their client's informal communication network. Remember the difference between verification and validation. Verification is about asking whether a product was built correctly. Test labs usually do verification. Contrast, validation is about asking whether the right product was built. When a tester argues their product won't serve the needs of its users, her perspective is a validation perspective. Most companies don't expect test labs to do validation. In fact, some react with outright hostility when an external lab criticizes the product's design or the value of that product for the intended market. That doesn't mean that external labs can't do validation. On some projects, I've seen some do it fairly well. But if you're a tester or a test manager in a lab and that's a service you want to provide, you need to be very clear with your client that's what you're going to do and make sure that that's what they want. You also have to figure out how you're going to budget to develop the expertise that you need to do this well. So how do we deal with all this organizational variation in this course? I think we have to make some assumptions. For the rest of this course, I'll assume that you're either working for a software publisher or for a competent test group within an IT organization. Most of what I'll present will be appropriate for external labs that are doing verification. But if that's your situation, you need to supply your own relevance filter.